So a few years ago, uh, Odette and I had an idea of studying the effects on drugs and alcohol on decision making. I studied decision making in general, I thought Burning Man would be the best place to do it. So we came here and we tried to do all kinds of experiments. It turns out that people were either not drugged enough or way too drugged. <laughs> we never got the exact sweet spot, so if at any point in the next few days you're interested in participating in an experiment and you are in that sweet spot, come and look for us. But I actually want to talk about something else. I want to talk about how we think about money in general and how we think about social interactions. So consider the following. Imagine you're a 24-year-old guy. You're on a date. It's been great. You've gone to the theater. You went some, got some drinks afterward. And now you're walking with your date to her apartment. And you're hoping that this will end with a passionate goodnight kiss. And you're going up her steps. And you're leaning forward to kiss her. And just before you lean, you say, by the way, the date so far cost me $116. How will that experiment turn out? You know? Most likely not very well. And the question is why? Because everybody knows how much money was changing hand and who paid for what and what are the prices. But the moment we make price explicit, something seemed to change in the relationship. Or consider another idea. Imagine that I asked you to help me. I said, hey, would you help me change the tire on my car, do something? And think to yourself, what's the likelihood that you would help me? Now, what would happen if instead I would say, would you help me change the tire on my car? I'll give you $5. Now, most likely, you would say, no, thank you. I don't work for $5. Give me 150 we can talk. <laughs> what happens here, and we've shown it in many experiments, is that when we pay people nothing, people are very happy to pay, to, to work, to help, to assist. When we add money to the equation, often the motivation decreases rather than increase. So we can take a motivation that people have to help, we can offer them a little bit of money. And rather than getting people to say, gee, I get to help done, plus I get money, they actually are less motivated. If we pay them a lot of money, of course, people can work, will work again a lot. And I think this is, for example, what we're doing for teachers with a No Child Left Behind policy. We're taking teachers who are internally motivated to care for their kids, and then we give them a slight amount of money that is contingent of their kids performing well in high school, and rather than increase the motivation, it does what we call crowding out. It eliminates the internal motivation. So we have this pattern that you add money and people care less, uh, at least for a while. Now, if you think about it, uh, there's all kinds of things that we have to have exchanges, right? I mean, workplace, government, I mean, there's lots of things that ha they have to have money. We think that we have this social norm, the social world in which we do things for each other. We have these market norms in which we go and we work for pay. And most of these things are kind of in the middle. And in the middle, we have these problems. So what do we do? Well, one of the things that people have solved is about gift giving. So think about gift. From an economic perspective, gifts are incredibly odd. If you invited me for dinner, and I was going to spend $50 a bottle of wine, I should come to you and I should say, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm delighted, but I don't know which wine you like. You like red, white, what type? I'm going to spend $50, maybe giving you only $25 of benefit out of that. So instead, here is $35. Go and buy yourself something that would maximize your utility. <laughs> right? That would be the answer that an economist will give you about what what gifts are for. It's inefficient. But at the same time that it's economically inefficient, it's socially efficient. So when we do our experiments, we get people to help us pick sofas, and we get people to help us do all kinds of boring stuff on computers. And we see this pattern. We pay them nothing, they work hard. We pay them a little bit, they don't work at all. We pay them a lot, they work again. What happened when we have a gift? What happened when you say, here's a tiny gift, a tiny bit of chocolate. Here's a big chocolate. What happened? Would people get upset? With a small chocolate? No. It turns out that the moment that we remain in the social realm, the moment that we stay in the social good in which we just give each other gifts, money doesn't enter the equation and people don't get offended. We don't get this reduction in effort. Small gifts are great. Small amounts of money are terrible. The last question we ask is, what happens when you have both? Imagine you invited me for dinner and I say, here's a $40 bottle of wine. I give you the gift, but I remind you how the money works underneath it. What would happen? Would it look like money when people get demotivated by a small amount, or would it look like gift that people keep on their motivation and desire to help? Turns out the moment you add money to the equation, 
motivation goes down dramatically. It's enough for us to remind people that behind these in transactions is actually money. We apply very different norms to it, and we're not willing to help each other out of the generosity of our heart. It takes away all of our uh, humanity and care, in a way. There was a funny story in the news a few years ago. There was a woman who wrote uh, to, on Craigslist, and she said she was a very beautiful woman, and she has been wanting to date men who make more than $500,000 a year. Uh, this was before the financial crisis, and she lived in New York. And she said she needs some help. She said, look, I reached a plateau. I've been dating men that make up to 250000 but I've not been able to break this barrier. Help me. And she got a lot of advice. Uh, a lot of people got angry with her. And you know, in many ways, uh, we all know that more beautiful ma women marry richer men. I mean, that's not a big secret. But the fact that she said it explicitly created a very different contract. And imagine that you yourself entered one of those contracts, right? It will be really strange. And what captured this the most was an answer from a banker who wrote her and he said, you know what, I make enough money. But here is how I view this transaction. I have money and resources, and most likely my resources would increase over time. You're very beautiful, but most likely your resources will decrease. <laughs> And under those conditions, I might as well lease. <laughs> so, so what is the point for thinking about Burning Man? If we think about this continuum between social norms in which we do things for other people, and we think about financial norms in which we do things for money, and most of the relationships we have are somewhere in the middle. I think what's special about this place is that the money norm, the monetary norm, are just not existent. They're just not even part of the equation. So by itself, we're moving further away in the equation. And that is allowing us to create very different social norms, right? All of a sudden, we're not bounded by this relationship. So not having money, I think, is key. And the second thing is gifts, right? Gifts are really a really interesting value for an economy. It's not efficient from a financial perspective. You're not always getting what is you could get if the market was uh, complex and um, <coughs> efficient. But at the same time, it's socially efficient. And at the end of the day, in these socially efficient markets, I think we are getting more than we put into it. And thank you very much.